Charlie, take it away. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mike Lynch. Uh, so uh, Mike, please tell us about uh, your living history. Yeah, sorry, I didn't prepare any slides, but I'll just sort of give you a verbal narrative of my life. It's not a conventional pathway, but I guess I wouldn't advise it for anybody else, but I wouldn't change it for myself. Uh, I, I grew up in a small town, uh, Auburn, New York, known for the big prison. And uh, no one in my family had ever gone to college before. If you were a, a male in the family, you went to a world war and you came back and worked in a factory and that was your life. And that's what I thought I would be heading towards, but a, a few things happened along the way that uh, fortunately bypassed that. Um, I did grow up at the edge of town along a, a big lake and lots of woods out there. So I, I did learn to enjoy nature quite a bit. Had a little tiny microscope about the size of a cell phone and got to gaze at a variety of things and, and got excited about that. Uh, high school, I was just sort of an average student. I pretty much lived for the one biology class taught there, the only one, and uh, made it through that. And other than that, sort of blundered through high school. And then it was time to think about what to do. I didn't think I would go to college, but there was this thing called the Vietnam War at the time, and I had to figure out a way to avoid that. And my parents agreed with that as well. My mother really was religious, wanted me to be a priest. And there was this place called St. Bonaventure University, had the best basketball team in the country at the time. And we went down and visited that. And as a private school, pretty expensive. But the president of the university met with us and said they'd given me a scholarship. So ended up being the only place they applied to. I ended up going to St. Bonaventure, majoring in biology. If you're in biology at a small place like that, you're going to be a doctor. That's why you're in the biology department. And that's where all my friends thought they were headed. But usually after about the first three months, you knew you weren't going to med school after you went through organic chemistry and so on. But I I did survive that. I uh, started to do a little bit of research, an amazing natural historian there named Dr. Stephen Eaton, who got me a bit interested in uh, the research side of biology. I barely knew what research was, but St. Bonometry actually had a PhD program uh, with three PhD students in the whole program. And I started hanging out with them uh, I had to work in factories, and uh, I, I worked at a security desk from uh, one in the morning to six in the morning every day to support myself through school. Uh, so my life was pretty packed. I was also on the tennis team, and I was uh, doing uh, bad things to my body on the weekends with organic chemicals and so on. So I had a pretty full life. Uh, I was likely to get into medical school. Uh, no one, uh, despite St. Bonaventure University's aspirations, no student had ever gotten accept accepted into a medical school. And so I got this call one morning at eight o'clock in the morning and stumbled out of bed because I'd just gone to sleep and sort of said, well, I'll think about coming for the interview. And you don't do that uh, to a med school invitation. And then I uh, had to make a decision and I, I realized that med school wasn't really for me. I thought about uh, graduate school at this point. I wanted to go to Cornell, couldn't get accepted into Cornell. Uh, so I realized that there was a neat paper written in this magazine called Science on algae and lakes by a guy in Minnesota. And I knew Minnesota had lots of lakes and I liked lakes. And somehow I got accepted in the University of Minnesota, headed out there, never been to a big city before in my life. And so this was both thrilling and, and terrifying at the time. Uh, I had no idea what I didn't know. As soon as I got there, I knew it was way, way in over my head. I didn't even know the language people were speaking in science. And so it took me uh, quite a bit of time to get adapted. I almost failed out of my advisor's course the first semester. All these students from fisheries biology with little fish hooks coming out of their hats were getting 95s. And I was getting like 35s. I couldn't figure out what was happening. Later on, I, they were really hard exams. Later on, I, I found out that uh, my advisor had been giving the same exam for the last 15 years, and everybody but me knew this. Anyhow, I, I, I really panicked and read the treatise of limnology through three times before the final exam passed it. And then fortunately, at Minnesota graduate student exams weren't until the third year. And so I had three years to sort of catch up. And at that point, uh, I was I was fairly well embedded. I started getting interested in math. My advisor made me take civil engineering courses. I had to learn how to design sewage treatment plants. And that's where I learned about fixed law and diffusion theory and so on, which I now use in the field of population genetics. 
Now, there were a number of postdocs there at the time who were uh, complaining all the time and not, not being able to get jobs. So I started applying for jobs early before I finished my PhD. And somehow I managed to get an interview at the University of Rhode Island. Unfortunately, I got seafood poisoning on that interview. It was a complete disaster. I had to leave in the middle of the interview. That was kind of, kind of crushing. But then I got one more interview at the University of Illinois. And I ended up getting that job, moved there, and uh, started out as a limnologist there. I was starting to get more into theory. I had uh, really uh, benefited from being in the early days of the development of population ecology theory. And when I got to Illinois, I started thinking about genetics um, uh, much more frequently. I really benefited from benign neglect by my department head there. No third year reviews, not even annual reviews. And then suddenly in year five, my my department had said, well, you've got to go up for tenure. You've got to fill out these files. And I didn't believe in the tenure system at the time. So I said, well, can you just get me a seven-year renewable contract? And I, I guess he ended up putting together my tenure file. And later he came in and told me, well, I've been awarded tenure. And then I tried to get out of that. Uh, didn't work out. The university lawyers didn't like this because of the effect it might have on the other faculty. And then I had to sort of panic because I had two young kids and I didn't have a job. I was either going to have to accept tenure or, or leave, and I accepted tenure. Stayed at Illinois for quite a while. This is the blooming of the time of uh, quantitative genetics, and the best group in statistical genetics was at Illinois at the time. And so I really profited from that, learned a lot about genetics. And then University of Oregon called me. I got attracted to big trees, moved out to Oregon to start a new program in ecology and evolution. And this was the emergence of ge the genomics era. And so we got interested in developing theory for how genomes evolved. I worked with a student who was very influential in me, Alan Force. The Force is no longer with us. He started, uh, he dropped out of academia and started a band called Bending Spoons. Uh, things fell apart while I was at Oregon. I was on a 12 year cycle. I guess it was time to go. I got a call from Indiana University and I had done a lot in evolutionary genomics. It was time to make a shift, I thought. And so I got interested in maybe moving up a level to the cellular level. And I got invited to a conference at the KITP, Kavli Institute of Theoretical Physics, by Michael Brenner and Mukund Fatai. And I was on sabbatical. I spent three months there just listening to all the all-stars give talks in cell biology. And I, I thought, well, maybe I can make a contribution by linking evolution and cell biology. And that's what I did for the next 12 years or so. And I've got a book coming out uh, in just a few months on the origins of cellular architecture. Uh, what came next was, uh, so three big state institutions, what came next is an offer from Arizona State University to start a new center called uh, Mechanisms of Evolution. One of the big problems I've had all the time as an academician is this big wall between molecular and cell biologists on the one hand and whole organism biologists on the other, and I was always right in the middle. So it was not a comfortable place to be. And Arizona State University has given me the opportunity to build a new group, merging together cell biology, biophysics, and evolution, I hope, in, in novel ways. Having spent 12 years in uh, cell biology, it's time to think about something new. I don't really know what that will be. Uh, hopefully, uh, something will happen in the next several months. I am still have a really big lab, and I uh, probably the thing I generate most now is is seeing my graduate students and postdocs develop their careers and go on to be successful mentors themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. I'm uh, budding uh, on behalf of the audience. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, so start out with a, a question that I had. So you were um, kind of describing the role of um, what, what sounds like, you know, a chance happenings and that led to some major decisions. And I was particularly struck by your story of going to a conference and saying, oh, maybe I can make a contribution here. How did you take that you know, realization and you know, make it happen and turn that into something that lasted for you know, over a decade? Well, if you're talking about the cell biology thing, it did take a lot of thinking. I had to think about I'm an evolutionary biologist. So I had to spend a lot of time thinking about what details, you know, do I need to know and which ones don't I need to know? What are the comparative differences between different organisms? And we have this great uh, mathematical theory of population genetics, but it's just focused on changes in gene frequencies or allele frequencies. It doesn't say anything about how they connect to biology. 
So I had to really think about ways to link that existing theory with what actually goes on biologically. And I have to say, I, after that first trip to KHP, I've been back, I think, five times. And this has ended up having a huge influence on my life, these multidisciplinary or integrative conferences there. I've learned a lot from people outside my field. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so I uh, I guess I'll have... Um, 